Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session. Um, I'd just like to welcome everybody here today. Um, this is a series which has been uh, kicked off uh, by myself and uh, Andy Greaves as part of Cyber Ireland, um, where we're really trying to foster a collaborative community for threat intelligence in Ireland. Um, we kind of divided this into three phases as, you know, there's a lot to cover. So we started out with a zero to hero phase, which was four sessions to really give everybody a background who didn't, weren't experts in um, threat intelligence, a, a back, background and baseline for the rest of the series. Now we're moving on to the implementation phase where we have three, four sessions. Today we have Mike talking, which I'll go into detail in a moment. And then we will also have Derek Buchanan um, next month talking from CrowdStrike and Jamie Collier from FireEye. And then we will finish off the imitation phase uh, with Ishmael Venezuela, who is a, a senior science instructor and expert in uh, threat hunting playbooks and security operations. So he works in MacView with myself. So we have a really, really strong lineup for the implementation phase over the next four months, which takes us to the end of June. And then after that, we will focus on from September, three more sessions where we will talk about building resilience into your, um, your program. So delighted to introduce uh, Mike Walsh here today. Um, Mike is, is a really, really experienced in active defense. I was lucky enough to work with the Qualcomm team a couple of years back, and they're a really, really mature uh, team and really, really advanced and uh, really excited about Mike coming in here today. So thank you, Mike, and take it away. Thanks very much, Owen. I uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, so yep, yeah, um, just before I start, uh, Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. Uh, this is going to be a presentation on active defense with effective incident response. So before we start, um, just to give you a bit of an overview, uh, as I said, my name is Michael Walsh. Uh, I am a senior information security en engineer with Qualcomm. To give you a slight background and kind of where I came from, um, I would have studied computer forensics and security in Warford Institute of Technology, uh, going back to I'd say it was 2012. Um, and as part of that course, I did an internship where I was lucky enough to work with some of the guys in Qualcomm and Cork. That's where, where I would have met Owen. Um, so that would have been meant to be an initial 12 week internship, which then turned out to be an eight month love affair with the company. Uh, so when I graduated, um, I was living in Waterford. So I took the opportunity to go work for a Canadian insurance company, uh, just doing general IT security based role which would range from, I suppose, phishing to malware analysis, incident response, and just general day-to-day -day security slash kind of blue team work. So I worked there for about three years and an opportunity came back for me to, uh, to, to apply for a role within Qual Qualcomm. And I suppose I felt at that point, I was kind of looking to, I suppose, look towards kind of a different challenge. And as I said, the role in Qualcomm, it did differ ever so slightly to the role I was in. Um, that it was more threat hunting and, and threat intelligence focused. And I felt that was a slant of security, which at the time uh, was relatively new and it was something that I kind of wanted to get into. So kind of outside of that, as you can see, my day-to-day -day tasks, I do very much kind of uh, moonlight in IR, which is the team of this presentation. Um, but I also do some investigation work detection development based on, I suppose, IR action items and alerts, and then it obviously threat hunting and general blue team activities. Um, and outside of, I suppose, all that kind of security IT stuff, um, I am an out and out nerd. So when I'm not kind of defending the line of security, I do kind of still find myself in front of a computer learning new things and weather permitting, I do enjoy a good round of golf, but put it this way, I won't be retiring security to join the PGA tour just yet. So, um, yeah, to move on to uh, the actual agenda itself. So, uh, stepping you through the agenda, I'm going to briefly go through some of the a deeper dive into critical thinking and the importance of, I suppose, setting a mindset for incident response. And then I will go you through the processes behind IR, uh, the roles which define these processes in order to get, I suppose, the most out of them. And then the last two sections then is kind of the testing uh, the testing requirements to maintain a good IR process, and then the takeaway items associated to the learning and development of your kind of after action items. So, uh, so why critical thinking? So in, in information security, and to be honest, let, let alone in incident response, we often run into roadblocks um, and developing critical, critical thinking skill is something that allows us to kind of a, to get around these, these blocks. So critical thinking comes with practice. The benefit of critical thinking is it will typically aid you in a logical approach to try and 
avoid situations where we can end up kind of grasping at straws and it can lead us to us creating what kind of like far-fetched kind of hypotheses and theories, um, which are things which we really want to try and avoid in IR. And if we can do this, we can find a way back out of, I suppose, these kind of holes that we can get ourselves in. And we try to reason, evaluate and apply these problem solving skills to, I suppose, develop these areas. So um, th this theory, uh, so that the hypothesis with the fewest number of assumptions is generally correct. So this is a theory um, many, many years old, which is a quote from a gentleman called William of Ockram. So the thought of this is it's the simplest solution is usually the answer. This is generally true, um, but not always as simple and as straightforward as this. Um, this also comes down to the theory that of, yes, the simplest solution is the answer, but not always the, necessarily the simplest solution you know of is the answer. Um, and this kind of comes with the ability to kind of have time to think um, that will aid kind of logical thinking. And that, that quote is to try and avoid the overthinking, the overcomplication of certain situations. So stepping through that a little bit, I'm going to talk through the analysis of competing hypotheses, known as ACH. So the analysis of uh, critical thinking is uh, a skill um, or a hypothesis. It was developed by a gentleman called Richards of Your in the 1970s, um, who was a 45-year veteran of the CIA. He did produce many books and methodologies, but ACH is kind of one of those ones that has kind of stood out in not just um, kind of, I suppose, intelligence, but across kind of IT as a whole. And it's kind of relevant across many fields. And um, we did also come up with a second book um, called The Philosophy of Intelligence Analysis. And below there is a quote that's straight out of Wikipedia, um, but I thought it was very interesting. So ACH um, was a step forward in intelligence analysis methodologies, but was first described in the relatively informal terms. So producing the best available information from uncertain data remains the goal of researchers, tool builders, analysts in industry, academia, and governments. So to kind of step through the ACH process. So stepping through in a little bit more detail, the first thing we do within ACH is, as you can see there, is step one, you formulate your hypothesis. And this is done in many ways. And we can look at, for example, as you can see there, brainstorming. Um, brainstorming is one element that I suppose you can use to try and come up with hypotheses within a certain situation. Um, but brainstorming isn't the only element to, I suppose, try and come up with hypotheses, whatever really works for you or your IR team. Um, and it's not just an approach to formulate hypotheses. It's also a case of, and a very important point I mentioned there is eliminate, eliminating your, co your cognitive bias or biases, um, which is very important to this theory. Um, as I mentioned, you can see there as many steps of engagement through ACH. And we could probably speak to the entire ACH process alone in detail for a lot of time that's allocated just for today's talk. But I wanted to bring ACH to your mindset due to, I suppose, the impact that I find it can refine the approach, to not just IR, but investigation work, anything really that involves problem solving as a key concept. So stepping through is kind of quickly the what evidence we have to support what we are thinking and what assumptions or if unsure, what are our deductions and what do we know versus what do we assume? So moving on to the kind of the diagnosis elements. So if you see the matrix element, then it's kind of the process of putting scores associated to trying to bring some objectivity to some scoring to an hypothesis. So people can do this in a list form. People can do it by adding pluses and minuses to hypotheses that they feel of or more value, or just like to physically score them to add more value, value to an interesting approach. So one of the key aspects then is kind of the refinement. So refining your hypothesis based on a discovery. And then also one of the key concepts is to refute your hypothesis. Um, to refute your hypothesis is often more of an effort of going to disprove your hypothesis. And then we move on to, I suppose, other areas such as inconsistency stages. And they speak to about removing the least consistent hypothesis. And this comes from evidence gathering and the move through, I suppose, potential incidents, new evidence that will come to light that will remove previous hypothesis. And 
I kind of I've highlighted an element there of the don't overvalue your own judgment. And this comes back to the very important point of eliminating your cognitive biases in the sense that even though you feel something could be this has to be it, this is our in theory smoking gun. Sometimes you just have to step back from it and go, OK, maybe it's not 100 percent right. And what could be something that would confirm or deny that hypothesis? And then if you look then to the sensitivity. So it is important to recognize that um, being objective to a situation. So don't be afraid to ask yourself, what if I am wrong? You may be willing to criticize yourself. You have to be willing to criticize yourself, your evidence or any of the hypotheses that you're kind of coming up with. And in my opinion, it's the definition of critical thinking. Uh, you arrive at a conclusion here, and that doesn't kind of mean that you're at the end of your analysis, the data to move your hypothesis up and down. So it comes to the conclusion in the moment. So you conclude which best evidence is leading to you and you talk to you talk about alternatives and based on what you know you then create new tasks and iterate through your process again um, so while this can seem to be maybe a kind of a slightly long-winded approach um, i cannot emphasize i suppose the value of this mindset of critical thinking when it comes to ir and as i said at the start it really comes down to practice and kind of thinking about right how can i formulate hypothesis to try and come up with the best approach to, I suppose, solve a situation, be it in IR or any sort of area associated to problem solving in IT. So moving into actual IR itself. So within this section, I'm going to speak you through some of the key areas of IR. So these include IR frameworks and methodologies. And um, some of these have been tried and tested for many years. And then we're going to speak through some of the key roles that are going to be assigned to IR team members and knowing and moving um, awareness to them going forward. So moving into the, the methodology. So there are two main industry standard incident response frameworks. Um, introducing them in kind of no particular order, NIST and SANS are the dominant institutes whose incident response steps have, to be honest, kind of formed the standards for this industry. So to those who aren't aware, uh, NIST stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Um, they're a government agency and they're proudly proclaimed as being one of the nation's oldest uh, physical science laboratories. Um, and they work on kind of all things technology, including cybersecurity, um, but they've become one of two industry standards as the go-to instant response with, the, with their instant response steps and approaches. Um, and then there's the SANS, um, methodology. So SANS stands for Sysadmin, Audit, Network and Security. Um, and many people might have heard of SANS. Uh, they do a lot of training uh, within kind of IT and kind of security as a whole. But they're a private organization that, per their description, is a cooperative uh, research and education organization. Uh, through more useful uh, than NIST, their sole focus is security and they've become as I said, the industry standard framework for, in, for incident response in conjunction with NIST. So the differences between NIST and SANS in incident response steps. So you could probably see very similarities in the, the two frameworks. They, they have kind of overlapping um, elements and the kind of element that we're looking at is with the two standard frameworks, there's a chance for familiar with one but not the other. So you might know of one but may not have heard of the other. So let's talk through, I suppose, some of the familiarities and the differences. Um, and I said NIST and SANS have kind of all the competencies that can kind of can flow, uh, but kind of have different verbiage and clusters. Um, so the kind of which instant response framework is best for you? So to have a definitive answer to this, there's no chance of me telling you this is the one to go for. Um, it really comes down to your personal preference. Um, which one makes more sense to you? Uh, do, do you want to break containment, eradication, and recovery into their own steps? Or do you want to keep them together in a single step? Um, it comes down to your enterprise, resourcing and approach to IR. Um, but there are certain key takeaways. And the takeaways have to be in the process. And that is what I'm going to speak to next, which is knowing your role. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk you through some of the key elements to having some interesting roles within instant response. So the main three I'm going to speak to initially are the first one, which I have highlighted here on the screen, which is an instant commander. So the instant commander lead is 
the response to an in, is the response to an incident. So the commander makes decisions regarding how a response is handled. So within the C cert effort, progress from one step. Um, of the incident response process to the next, and then directs uh, directs the, the, the personnel to engage in different response. And the main focus of the commander is to ensure that they progress through the IR life cycle. Um, we then have the instant communicator. So the communicator is, is responsible for preparing communications, um, including the potential declaration of an incident. Um, incident updates, and then the end of active end of an active incident if it comes to that conclusion. And the communi communicator is responsible for informing management and their affected parties of the incident response actions. Um, and then the, the third role then is the actual scribe. So the incident scribe is responsible for ensuring that incident artifacts, artifacts are appropriately documented. So many times during a non-structured incident, um, an IR team can end up with an Excel spreadsheet, maybe a Microsoft OneNote, or a simple text file uh, with IOCs that could be prevalent to an investigation or an incident. And having someone that's a dedicated resource to control the flow of findings is going to be valuable to ensure that your incident response process is effectively dealt with and handled in the best possible way. Um, so those are the kind of the three main areas within, I suppose, your kind of the roles of incident response, but then you have the kind of response team members. So the, the response team members can be a range of people. So outside of that, I mentioned the three previous roles, um, it's still vitally important to maintain focus for other engagement IR parties. And this can be ranging from potential SOC engagement to other IR members who are going to be doing key log analysis, to seam system monitoring, to scoping and investigation for forensic collection, and ranging from, I said, memory analysis to collecting physical disk images in order to find that said smoking gun associated to an incident. And I suppose one of the, the, the key elements to, I suppose, the response team member is two elements which I haven't included in the slide here, um, and something that is very important to anyone who's kind of in, in incident response, and that's number one, don't touch the box. So this comes back to, I suppose, you see something that kind of you're more concerned about or you would go, okay, that's a hypothesis I want to go with. And we don't get physical and kind of go, oh, I'm going to kind of log into this box to see what happened because that could contain or that could alter the potential evidence on that box. Um, and then I suppose most importantly, and it's something that is typically overlooked, is just breathe. The, the benefit of being able to step back from an incident and just take a deep breath, potentially even walk away, um, take five minutes to clear your head. And that will be something that will give you the, the thought process to refocus, to, I suppose, give a better engagement to instant response. Um, that's something that I just thought I would include as something that can be overlooked. Um, so then moving on to uh, the instant response sections. Um, I cannot stress the importance really of knowing what is what within uh, IR section systems. So there is nothing worse than needing an expert to hand and not knowing who is the correct individual team or department to contact. Having a topology like this across your environment will stand to be absolutely invaluable to you. So I'm gonna start from left to right at a high level. Um, so starting at forensic collection, it's detrimental to any IR team that you have the ability to pull the required Forensic images needed to investigate a host. Typically, this is going to be a network uh, at the network or memory level. Nine times out of 10, your disk image analysis will be part of a follow up after action item, um, just because of the time it might take to do a full disk analysis. Um, but you still want to be able to pull the key IOCs associated to a host level compromise. Um, and that's the kind of the key elements to kind of forensic analysis. And then moving on to log analysis is having the ability to be able to do the required log analysis at multiple system levels. So it's vitally important that there's a range of Windows event logs to EDR tools, maybe even OS-based queries across multiple operating systems. As anyone who knows it, that's kind of dealt with IR, um, sometimes you have to adapt and overcome uh, to what the situation throws at you. So having these skills to go, okay, I need to look at this tool to use this, we say, 
Mac artifact is going to be of massive benefit. And then I suppose moving to reverse engineering, having a member of your team or your IR team, and more importantly, who's comfortable in skilled reverse engineering will give you that insight into the, in theory, initial infection vector, which is what everyone strives to, to kind of find within an investigation. And this IOC or indicator of compromise will then allow you to build detections going forward. And these IOCs are noted during the reverse engineering process. Um, and then the scripting and coding elements, touching on at a very kind of high level, having someone who's able to, I suppose, in theory, if you find something on your system that needs to be rolled out quickly and effectively, but able to find a simple script to engage multiple systems will be of massive benefit during an IR process. Um, and then moving on to the information security aspect. So um, kind of within information security, having to engage parties from engineering to identity access management and risk will allow you to have the foresight to reduce the risk by engaging them at the earliest possible time. And it will then allow you to address potential exposures at a system level. Um, and then IT engagement. So IT level engages is probably the one most important aspect to the IR response sections because anyone who's kind of dealt with IR in the past knows that one of these four elements listed from networking servers, applications, and messaging will typically be impacted by an instant response. So yet again, having a contact list ready, knowing where your engagement is going to be, will be detrimental to the success of an IR process. And then moving to security as a whole, probably the, as I would, I'm going to say, the least engaged element is the one of the kind of the physical pen tests. And, but they are becoming more and more predominant. And it's good to be known that the people to be in contact with, if there, is, if there is potential issues with, we say hypothetically, locks, security cameras, and the other physical security devices in your environment. And then, then you move to brand protection, which is also a great awareness piece if you feel that your company is kind of moving to um, potential situations where the brand could be impacted. And then finally then is addressing the corporate side um, of the kind of, the instant response section, which is to maintain open communication channels with potentially important parties during IR engagement. This, as you can see here, can be legal and privacy for potential possible awareness for data leaks. Um, and then obviously you have the public relations in addressing to, I suppose, the impact to companies at a public address level, um, which will be then also limited to the HR for any information or engagement which may be required from a more kind of staff level. So I'm then going to move on to the other element which I find is vitally important which is testing, testing, testing. So as you can see highlighted in the three bullet points there at the bottom, um, this is very much uh, what's going to stand to you as the definitive test for your IR process. Um, I'm going to speak to the, the, the three of them because they're, in my opinion, different styles of engagements for an IR uh, process. So starting with a tabletop exercise. Um, so this is very much process driven and will quickly make you aware of gaps in your processes. So you can arrange as part of a tabletop exercise to have a simulated engagement with your IR team, which will reiterate the importance of having your IR sections previously defined in the previous slide. So you can have a, a theory where you have an IR engagement that's a tabletop exercise, and you can have, for example, key members of the networking team to come in and engage you if you feel something is an IR engagement that is relevant to networking. Um, and then moving on to the red team engagement, in my opinion, this is probably the most challenging of all uh, the potential testing exercises. Red team tend to know a lot more than anyone else uh, when it comes to uh, your security controls. So they're going to know about your tooling, they're going to know about your gaps, they're going to know about the nuances in your network and in your environment, and they're going to have experience with, I suppose, trying to bypass your controls because they'll know what is what. Um, and as I said, they bring together the processes, but also the technical elements without knowing uh, to also test your processes and procedures within an IR engagement. And then you have the external pen testing element. So this can be a different element because 
This is going to be an external party coming in that will have a task set to them to go. Your goal as part of an external pen test is, we say hypothetically, to extract customer data associated to a certain website. The benefit of, I suppose, external pen tests is they don't know your environment. So they could, this will give you the benefit of being able to test your alerts um, in the sense that you will be hoping at some point during an external pen test, some alert is going to fire that will allow you to trigger one of your alerts that will then engage the IR process to try and discover what this external pen test, that the motivations and the attacks behind it. Um, and then obviously the benefits. I'm not going to speak through them. I think everyone will be aware of the benefits of kind of going through uh, this from a CSER process. It just comes down to having the time um, impacting the environment by making sure that you, your company takes time to test these processes from tabletop to red, to red team exercises to external pen tests. And then finally, um, my final slide is a lessons learned and actions item slide. So lessons learned from engaging is what's going to stand to you to your development of your processes and procedures to make your IR team a well-oiled machine. So you need to debrief to address lessons learned and improvement opportunities in order to stay fresh and well-oiled. Um, so every incident needs to be documented in full and briefed out to any parties which are involved, including the departments which may have been potentially impacted due to changes and mitigation controls made. And then concluding your forensic analysis to add detections and mitigations is essential to maintain the controls, uh, which are looking to kind of strive and move forward with in kind of a testing environment um, after an IR engagement. And then the last item which I'm gonna cover then is uh, as, as a group, is to actually just step back from an IR engagement and be honest, what went well, what didn't go well, um, what needs to be improved, did we, did we identify any gaps in our processes? Um, is our environment known to have knowledge, to have gaps or do we have knowledge gaps within our team? It is lessons learned items that will add the value to your skills and ensure that your engagement is getting better and better with time. And then finally, the, the final point I'm making at the very end there is fail to prepare, prepare to fail in the sense that you have to be prepared to fail if you're not going to be prepared to test your IR process in theory, from start to finish. Um, so that's kind of a, a whirlwind tour of, I suppose, the IR process. Um, I've come to the end, so I'm going to hand it back over to Owen and we can uh, speak through any other elements or if anyone has any questions they want to throw at me, by all means, just shout. Hey, Mike, I think I think that was uh, that was really, really fantastic. And uh, I just have a question. There's one question coming, but just briefly, I wanted to ask you something first. So I think when everybody hears about instant response, everyone, you know, everyone loves, and myself included, love to jump into memory forensics and all the technical side, and, and that's fantastic, right? And to get an insight into what you guys have, your, your process is so mature, and you also have mature technical capabilities as well. But like not everybody here will have that capability or that investment, you know, et cetera. So, so I imagine like when you look at what you presented today, right? The process is so, so important, right? I mean, the technical aspect is important, but really, really, I imagine to start at the process level and really try and mature from there and get a strong process or oriented um, kind of team together would be is really, really important. Absolutely, and I said, in my opinion, the most important thing outside of processes is is that you have to then have a good team around you. So, uh, so it's having the ability to lean on your team to uh, kind of make sure that you are kind of making the best out of every situation that is an IR engagement. Great. Thank you. Um, and one question came in there, Mike, is what do you feel is the most important tool in instant response? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so I suppose, in my opinion, the most important tool in instant response is your team, who you have around you, and those people that are going to be there, be it your instant commander, to your scribe, to your communicator, to your IR team, that are going to be the, the, the definitive process to making sure that you're, as I said, well-oiled, well-drilled, and you know what to expect within every IR engagement. Great. Thanks, Mike. And maybe one last question I'm just going to ask, because I think maybe this is something that people will definitely um, find tangible is, so like, I suppose when we talk about instant response and threat intelligence, right, and we talk about hypothesis, 
you know, we really can't, I suppose, once we talk about the process, then we need to go and find artifacts, right? So I imagine it's really, really important when you start with your process level and you decide what capabilities you're going to have from an incident response perspective, like, you know, where your artifacts and your sources are going to come from, like your log capabilities, your network forensics. So I imagine that's really, really important to understand your infrastructure capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, Owen, that kind of comes with, with time, is knowing where your important artifacts are going to lie. And then, as you mentioned, formulating your hypothesis to go and try and avoid that situation where you end up, as we all have done, is going down a rabbit hole. Um, and just ensuring, and yet again, communicating to your team, going, I have seen this, this is an element which I feel is going to add value um, does everyone agree? You pass it back to the instant commander who's then going to assign that task to someone to make sure that it's one, it's adding value to the instant, but two, making sure that every task is being dealt with appropriately. 100%, Mike. And I think, yeah, definitely starting out with having the right sources for proxy logs, for example, et cetera, having all the basics in place, I think is really, really important. Um, and look, I think it was fantastic getting insight into how mature you guys are. And when you look at, I love that diagram you showed with the team, the way you know who to reach out to for reverse engineering, et cetera. Now, I know not every organization will have that capability, but I think it's fantastic to see, you know, where you can get that and how mature the capabilities you can build within an organization. Yeah, and I, I think, own that that's something that, as, as you mentioned, not everyone, not every organization will have the ability to have that full engagement, but every organization has the ability to map it out. So it's something that you can do in, yet again, a pre-process planning that, okay, shall we, shall we have an IR engagement? Who do we need to contact and when? And yet again, it just makes sure that everyone is on point and ready to address a situation depending on every IR engagement is different. Anyone who's, who's done one has known is it can be a Windows system one day, it can be a Linux system another day, it can be a general phishing email. They, every, everyone is typically different, so it, it, it's really good to be prepared to, to know what's what. Uh, that, that's a really great point, Mike. I, I think, you know, you, you, you know, you don't have to be expert to start with. I mean, you can start with the point of context you have for certain areas you need expertise in. And then from your instance, you can identify gaps, right? And you can justify funding then to build up resources as needed. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it comes back to. It comes back to uh, engagement of... Uh, in, engagement of management to go look we've, we're doing IR testing we're, we're struggling in these areas we feel it warrants more funding to maybe one build knowledge maybe two address a tooling gap or something like that to uh, to make sure that if something happens and something more serious like an APT group it hits your environment that you're ready and prepared. Hey, that was really great Mike and I really appreciate you coming in today and uh, I'd just like to say to everybody as well, I think what we're going to have at the end of this series, um, the last session in this implementation phase in June, like I said, we'll have Ishmael uh, Venezuela coming in, who's the senior SANS instructor. Mike spoke about the SANS process earlier, so that'd be really, really good. But we're also going to have like a 30-minute roundtable chat, like a fireside chat. So if that's something you want to be involved with, please reach out to us. We have some people already who want to be involved, but we do want to open it up to kind of discussions the first few sessions of the series were, were, you know, giving people background, but we really want to start having more conversations like this and getting people's opinions and really try and help them build that collaborative community. So um, thank everybody for, for your time today. And um, we'll see you in the next session, which is going to be in um, April with um, Derek Buchanan from CrowdStrike. Thanks very much, Owen. Great session. Thanks, guys.